speaking to you for the next few minutes about social capitalism, the changing expectations of business. What is this social capitalism that we're discussing? Why is it changing business in the way it is? Why is it such a powerful, transformative tool? And how can we generate it? And really, what can we do to maximize and harness the potential of this movement? Before I get into it though, I'd like to actually start by telling you a story about myself, a little background information about how I arrived both at these ideas and at this point. I was born and raised in Toronto, Ontario, and ever since I was a child I had a very deep passion for social justice, awareness, advocacy, to the extent that I wanted to pursue a career in international law. That was my be-all and end-all. So I completed high school and I was enrolled in university, I was starting my first day, my courses were chosen, I was all enthusiastic. And really there's only one significant problem, is the date. It was a Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. I woke up just after the first tower had been hit, and I watched with vivid memories, with my family, the falling of the towers. And intuitively I sensed that expectations of the world had changed, both the expectations of, our, of the world and our expectations of ourselves in this world. The events that would precede 9-11 in the months to come would deeply trouble me to such an extent that I began to re-examine my own priorities and my own position uh, in, in terms of what I wanted to do and accomplish. I ended up leaving university after my first semester, and this would begin a journey of discovery that would end up taking the better part of a decade, and in which time I would travel the world, live in various different cities, work all kinds of jobs, speak to as many people as possible, and try and learn as much and read as much as possible. And though I didn't know it at the time, I think what I was really trying to understand was consequences the consequences of our world system, the consequences of our actions, the results of the polarization of wealth and the centralization of power, the results of the mismanagement of natural resources, the results of trade policies and economic systems that forced and maintained dependency and caused abject poverty. And it took me a long time to realize what now seems quite obvious, that in the absence of wealth, natural resources, skilled labor, perhaps our greatest asset is what we've had all along, each other. This would lead me to come back to Canada with a new purpose and new academic direction. I would study global stewardship, and international development studies because I realized that perhaps the best way to really affect change is to develop relationships with people as people, to create partnerships with the communities that we wish to affect and therefore create customized solutions to specific needs and problems. I think this speaks to the social capitalism that I'm discussing today because generally Social capitalism or social capital is defined as the development and maintenance of our social relationships or our interpersonal networks that can be used as a means of production. Now what that actually produces is context specific, but actually I would argue that it's actually open. It could be used to produce a common good or used to produce a solution towards a shared vision or goal or it could also just be used to generate profit and money. So, being back in Canada now, and whether you want to call it the Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street, there's definitely a change that's happening amongst people, both as citizens and as consumers. So, 
to understand why social capitalism is, uh, is really changing things in such a way, let's look at the two reasons as to how it's doing that. So the first really is, as individuals, we have more access to more people and therefore more ideas and more information than ever before. And this is actually giving us more insights, not just into factors of production, but the cost of those productions, such as social costs or environmental costs. And what it's really doing is it's forcing a transparency amongst organizations. People simply want the, their purpose tied into the purpose or profit of the organizations that they're dealing with. The second way that, uh, or reason why social capitalism is so effective is because along with increased awareness, we also have increased capacity. For the first time, well, for the first time in human history, we can act on our desires and our wills faster and with more effectiveness than ever before. So what this is really doing is if we look at the industries that have already sort of changed to address these needs that are coming from consumers and coming from the market, businesses that have cleaned up their act, so to speak, we see it's not actually the result of top-down, vertical regulation from government. It's actually the result of lateral forces being driven by consumers in the market. So I think the next important thing here is if, uh, if we're going to assert that social capitalism is this revolutionary movement, or at least revolutionary causing movement, it's very important that we understand how it's generated, or how at least it's being generated in this context today. I would suggest two main ways. The first is one that we're, of course, very familiar with, technology. Whether it's the reorganization of our social interactions or social networks through tools such as Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, or whether it is transformations to the retail industry through online shopping and customized marketing. We see across the board, throughout the whole spectrum, social capitalism is transforming industries. Another example might be media industry. For the first time, individuals can not just be their own journalists, but their own broadcasters. And I think it's, I think it's fine. I mean, I get it in the sense that people may say, well, you know, all this social capitalism, the social networking, uh, social media, you know, it's great if I want to find sustainable shoes, or it's great if I want to use my BlackBerry to locate the closest uh, coffee shop that sells fair trade certified organic coffee. But how is it really transforming the power structure? How is it really challenging the conventional forms of authority? And to answer that, I would look at what has for a long time been perceived as one of the most untouchable sources of power, the banks. Organizations such as Kiva, for example, and there are many others, facilitate uh, essentially um, finance, um, financing uh, transactions between their members. So members can establish who they're going to a loan to, uh, on what terms, on what rate of return, and they're turning themselves into their own bank managers. So we really see this, this shift towards enabling that technology is doing here. Another way that social capitalism has more tra been, uh, been generated in a more traditional way is education. In this way, we see some of the largest expectations possible. Right now, there's a massive gap between the amount of information that our technology produces and our ability to absorb and learn and take in that information. And that basically spells out huge inefficiency. Social capitalism is also addressing this too. It's, it's leading the way in which we transform education and change the way we perceive learning. An example of this is the Khan Academy. Again, there are many others, but I use the Khan Academy only because it sort of encompasses all of the components here of what's, what's going on in this modern movement. It uses social media, technology, peer-to-peer -peer learning, transparency, and it brings all of that into the classroom. And it's bizarre because we think of bringing technology into the classroom as dehumanizing. 
But in actuality, it's having the opposite effect. It's freeing up valuable teacher time. It's making the teacher far more efficient and effective than they've ever been because they can address individual needs of students. So I think we can expect to see that uh, education will continue to change in this way. So really, what can we do about social capitalism to, to sort of harness it and, and to act on it? And that's really talking about democratizing the market. It's about opening up ourselves as businesses. It's about realizing that consumers can now be producers. Bringing the customer in to co-create value. Giving customers and consumers control. So in this way, it's more about, more than just specialized solutions and customized products. Because really the question we should be asking here is what can we do to create value for ourselves by enabling others to create value for themselves? Khalil Gibran once wrote that separation is not but an illusion of the mind, for indeed everything is connected. And I think this really sort of speaks to the underlying sentiment of the social capitalist movement. And that's reflected in the fact that managers that transition, that transition best into leaders today are those that embrace opening up, giving up control, bringing in the customer. Change can be a frightening thing, though it does provide many opportunities. It can be scary, especially at the pace in which it's changing faster than ever before in human history. So I think that social capitalism allows us to shape our future together, though. History teaches us very valuable lessons, but what I'd like to leave you with today is that Staring in the rearview mirror is no way to prepare for future problems. Integration, cooperation, these are the values of social capitalism. These are the necessary adjustments we need to make. Thank you very much.